and on to our new members. Our first inductee is a longtime coach who started at Shaker Heights High School. She is currently on the Ohio High School uh, Executive Committee. She is currently coaching at Mentor High School. Um, she is being presented by her longtime friend, a mentor, a Hall of Fame member himself, Mr. John Mercer from Homestead Falls in Oberlin. And we will be inducting Ms. Amy Rodiger today. <laughs> Boy, you look good. You really do. You say good morning well, too. I'm not going to make you do it again, but that was awesome. I thank you. I have the most enviable job of anybody this weekend. My task is it to introduce to you and to the Hall of Fame, Mrs. Amy Rodiger, to the OHSSL Coaches Hall of Fame. It's my distinct honor. The only problem that I'm going to have is that this is going to have to be an iceberg introduction. There's really only time for me to give you that little bit of a tip at the top. There's so much grace, so much beauty, so much passion in this woman that it would take far too long. We'd never make it to round one. When I learned that Amy had been elected to the Hall of Fame, I immediately had two reactions. Reaction number one was, this is fantastic. Reaction number two was, what the heck took us so long? She's really quite an amazing woman. I thought about the passion, the compassion, and the quality. Now, a quick side note to all of the competitors today. As you learn about Mrs. Rodiger and Mrs. And Mr. It's back today, I want you to notice some of the resemblances they're going to have to your own coaches. The men and women up here on the stage are brilliant coaches, and as you hear about their brilliance, you're going to recognize that same brilliance in your coaches, maybe your head coach, maybe your assistant coach. And when that happens, don't be surprised. They all agree with me. This room is filled with wonderful coaches, whether you're a team of one or a team of 80. And so don't be surprised, and don't forget to thank them at some point this weekend. They earned it. Amy is a coach who is a family person. Coaching is really a family affair for her, and I'm really pleased to see that her mom is here, her two children are here, and her sister drove in. This is really great. Her kids know all about speech and debate. They've known tab rooms since they were, wow, so small. And her mom was her first, was Amy's first real assistant. She was at so many tournaments as a judge and occasionally a nurse when people fell out of the stands. Do you remember? She was so much a present that we, presence that we coaches just called her mom. Zany's mom, but we call her mom. So I'm so pleased today to be able to say, hi, mom. <laughs> Amy Rodiger meets the qualifications. She exceeds the qualifications of a Hall of Fame coach. Yes, she's had a myriad number of state qualifiers, national qualifiers, national semifinalists, state final rounders, state champions. She served on district committees, executive committees, tab rooms, on and on and on. But what makes her exceptional isn't all of that work. What makes her exceptional is the success that she brings to students. And that success begins in the classroom because Amy Rodiger lives a double life. In addition to being a brilliant speech coach, she's a classroom teacher a national board-certified chemistry teacher who's been honored by her own district to help the other teachers in her district integrate technology into their classrooms. And in fact, if you go online, you're going to be able to find her. She's a tech guru. She's got a blog called A Lever and a Place to Stand. Check it out. I think that's a reference to some Greek guy, Archimedes. Have you heard of him? And, the, and she posts videos regularly. Check out Happy Mole Oween. Yep, she's a chemistry teacher. There's another video I didn't watch, Ionic and Molecular Similarities and Differences. And I'm not alone, there's only 29 views. But I'll tell you what really shocked me was the video called The Love Meter. It only has 10 views, I don't get that. If you talk with Amy's students, they will tell you that the work she does in the classroom inspires them, shapes them. Graduates say that their careers in science, they credit to her work. 
Her students regularly say she's tough but fair and tells absolutely the worst, most corniest jokes they've ever heard in their lives. <coughs> the thing that I am most impressed with, with Amy, is her passion for speech. She works for the success of her team every single week, but it goes beyond that. She works for the success of every single competitor in the OHSSL. This is most apparent in her work in Student Congress. It used to be that Student Congress wasn't even at this tournament. It was an afterthought in many of our districts. But Amy and a small core of dedicated coaches changed that and created Student Congress into what it is at this tournament today, the largest event at this tournament. So Student Congress competitors, she's already helped you on your way in speech and debate. And every member of the Cleveland District, I bet you Amy knows you by name. She knows how you're doing. She checks the ranks out in the tab room. There were times I think she knew my kids better than I did. And she rejoices when she sees their successes. And she grieves when she sees their stumbles. Even though they may not know of her rejoicing and her tears. And she understands what success really means. She understands that for some people, it's not a tournament championship. For some people, it's that one LD win. For some people, it's the courage to get up and make your second speech in that session of Congress. And for some people, it's their very first one. And she celebrates those victories with the same passion that she celebrates a tournament championship for one of her team members. Amy's temperament is also famous in Cleveland. Cleveland's resident curmudgeon, Mr. C. Frederick Snook, Hall of Fame member, was hosting a tournament. He reminded me of this a couple of weeks ago. He was hosting a tournament at Crestwood. And in the middle of the tournament, Mr. Snook was angry. No, strike that. He was enraged. No, strike that. He was beyond rage. He was in full meltdown. And he shouted, and he shouted, this is my tournament, darn it, and you'll do what I say. <laughs> I, I actually don't think he said darn it. <laughs> The tension in the tab room was so thick, you could cut it with a chainsaw. <laughs> and from a corner of the tab room, this young coach, Mrs. Rodiger, started singing gently and sweetly, Kumbaya. went on without that bitch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Rodiger is overqualified and overdue for this recognition. She has a passion for speech. She has a compassion for her students. She's a great teacher, a marvelous coach, and I am honored to call her my friend. And so, members of the Hall of Fame, competitors, ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to welcome the newest member of the Ohio High School Speech Coaches Hall of Fame, Mrs. Amy Rodiger. Before I say anything else, I'd like to express my congratulations to Missy Sturzbach, but also I'd like to acknowledge Chad Reese, Pam Pisa, and Dale Schilling, who are on the Hall of Fame ballot with us. Truly. I would be honored to be in a sentence with them. To have shared the ballot with them was really, really overwhelming and took my breath away. So thank you so much. A lot of people are talking this season about the use of visual aids in informative speaking. So it must, right? So it must be a little known fact that you've been allowed to use visual aids in Congress for a long time. A couple of years ago, I was trying to convince my Congress team that we should bring a felt board to tournaments with us to make spontaneous visuals in the moment. Now, the kids in the room look confused because you don't know what a felt board is, but this is like 1970s vacation Bible school smart board. <laughs> so my proposal was, you know, we could take some felt people
and slap them up here and while we're doing our Congress thing, and then we could say like 50% of the country supports Donald Trump. Or we could take some little felt circle pieces and we could make kind of an instant pie chart. Like I got that far and one of my students drew a circle on the board and pointed to it and said, 100% of this team thinks this is a terrible idea. <laughs> I was talking about using visual aids in my speech, my team thought the felt board was a genius idea, and it's become a little bit like truth or dare, so I guess there's no backing out now. I'm fully committed to the idea, so I'm going to give you 10 words and a felt board. When I was growing up, my mom was a nursing supervisor at a local hospital. Because this is a pretty important job, my sisters and I were given strict instructions never to call unless it was an emergency. The trouble was, it was always an emergency. And they were important things too, like, where are my blue socks? Or, did you know we're out of peanut butter? <laughs> now, when you called the hospital, there was a lady who sat behind a giant desk. <laughs> and she answered the phone. And she did it so many times a day that she started to sound like a machine when she said, a Richmond Heights General Hospital. And then in our most adult voice, we would say, may I please speak to the nursing supervisor? And then she would go, oh, thank you. <laughs> so we called so often that, you know, we listened to it all the time and we got to where we could do a pretty good imitation. So one morning there's a crisis, you know, like how do I make chocolate milk or something? So we call a oh, Richmond Heights General Hospital and then we say, may I please speak to the nursing supervisor? And she says, oh, thank you. And so I'm forcing around with my sisters on the phone, right? So I look at them and I'm like, oh, thank you. And then the unthinkable happened. On the other end of the phone, she said, you're welcome. <laughs> So in the spirit of that great lady who said thank you to me so many times, I'd like to start with my thank yous. And I'm going to start by thanking you for indulging me as I publicly thank these people who have been so important to me along my journey. So first to my children, thank you Theo and Charlotte for being willing to share me with all these other kids for 14 Saturdays a year and all of the other stuff that goes with it. It means so much to me that you're here today. You are a wonderful group of people, and I'm grateful to have gotten to coach every one of you. This particular group of seniors is so special to me, and I am really going to miss you next year. And by the way, they're the ones who are like, fell, bored, fell, bored. Okay. To the coaches of Cleveland, thanks for your fellowship and your creative energy and your support of me and especially of each other. I especially want to thank the Cleveland Tabbers who become like my family every week. My speech just disappeared. This is a bad moment. No, it's back. <laughs> Uh, thank, thanks so much to the Cleveland Tabbers for everything that you've taught me. I, I obviously want to thank John Mercer for his incredible introduction. You only have to watch him work with kids or be in a tab room for five minutes before you realize you want to emulate him, and I definitely want to do that. I need to say thank you to my administration for their support of our team. In fact, our superintendent, who's a Star Wars nut, has asked me to bring him a t-shirt. And last year at the state tournament, when he was tweeting things like, why can't we get any news about speech and debate, other coaches were saying to me, I don't think my superintendent even knows there's a tournament going on. In my career, I've been lucky to coach with two men who let me do and try whatever I wanted with the students I was coaching. And so I need to say thank you to Mark Rotar, mentors head coach, and Bob White from Shaker Heights. In fact, I need to say just a little bit more about Bob White, who drove down today so he could be here for the ceremony. When I was in college, it was my dream to direct plays. But when you get a, jo a job where theater is what it is, at Shaker Heights and also at Mentor, that's never going to happen for a chemistry teacher. So Bob invited me to coach with him, and my next best thing has become an even better thing. Bob has been a great colleague, mentor, and friend to me for 25 years. He's an unshakable ethical compass in a tab room and taught me to stay level-headed in there, and he always keeps me laughing. When the time was right, it was Bob who encouraged me into leadership roles in our district, and I never would have done that without his support and encouragement. So thanks, Bob. One last thank you. Oh, that's nice. They clapped for you. <laughs> He, he and I have been some
expression for 25 years about something as Hall of Fame bad. I hope this is Hall of Fame good, right? Okay, uh, one last thank you to my mom. One of my earliest memories is my sisters and I sitting around the one telephone in our grandparents' house waiting for news of a contest that my mom was in. And eventually the one phone rang. It was rotary dial because, you know, Miss Mulbach has already pointed out that we're old. Uh, so the phone rang and my mom was on the other end and she said she won the contest. So I was about six at the time and I think I thought she won something like Miss America. And when she got home from Columbus, there were pictures of her wearing a sash and holding flowers, so it seemed like she'd been crowned the queen of something. Well, it turned out what she had won was a, a public speaking contest, and she'd been crowned the Ohio spokesperson of the American Cancer Society. She spent two years traveling around the state, speaking at bowl -a -thons and swim -a -thons and spreading a message of hope. So she planted the public speaking seed early in me. My mom is also famous for her saying that you don't get to choose the activities that your kids will love, but once they choose, you get entirely on board. And so my mom has been a great debate judge, as you heard John say, um, and she organized concessions at my tournaments at Shaker and did the judge food for a lot of years. You've never seen anything until you've seen my mother make a salad in a hefty bag. It's really something. <laughs> So thanks, Mom, for being entirely on board with speech and debate since day one. And now some more work for all of you. At some point this weekend, find a moment to say thank you for someone. Not just thank you like when you hold the door or when you get done competing and you say thank you, but really and truly, think of a way that you can say thank you to someone and explain how what they did made a difference for you. So when I was in high school, I, I didn't do speech and debate because Mentor didn't have a team back then. So what I did was show choir. Now, now the people are back. So at first glance, show choir probably doesn't seem very much like speech and debate. We do a lot of this. But when you take a closer look, you see sort of this group of students who travel around from performance to performance and spend a lot of time on a bus. And they develop confidence and have experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have. And you see there, there are two people at the helm of the whole thing who are underworked, and, uh, sorry, overworked and underpaid and um, giving their heart and soul to the organization. So when I became a coach, I knew that a lot of the things that I wanted to do were things that I saw my director and his wife do in my time in the show choir. And I'm telling you this because each one of you will at some point leave this activity. And when you do, I'd like you to think about how you will pay it forward. Of course, we'd all be thrilled if you would give time back to our league, coach a team, volunteer at a camp, judge every year at districts, every little bit helps. But even if you wander away from forensics, I hope you'll find a way to use your incredible skills, especially your public speaking skills, to benefit a nonprofit. Now, at the beginning of 2016, there was a movement on Twitter called Hashtag One Word, where people were encouraged to think of the one word that summed up their hopes for 2016. So I'm gonna ask you to do that this morning, except I'd like your one word to be about why did you join the speech and debate team? And then after you come up with it, we're gonna shout them out. So everybody, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. Think of one word that describes why did you join the speech and debate team? Okay, are you ready? Now you, it's been great participation, so I'm gonna count to three and then everyone shout out your one word, okay? One, two, three. That was great. We're going to come back to those words in just a minute. Okay, so here's a podium, right, with the gavel. I know that I'm going to be remembered as the Congress lady. Uh, my last three words are what I would really like to be remembered for, but they came out of my work with a Congress student. It was about five years ago when I was coaching one of my most difficult ever students. He was hyper-focused on winning, sometimes at the expense of his teammates, which is a huge no-no for me. I started using a phrase with him to try and focus him on what was important about speech and debate, and that phrase is skills, not scores. 
The trouble with wanting to win, and I tell my team this all the time, is that the best kids don't always win. And part of that is because in a room full of Hall of Fame coaches, we wouldn't all agree on who the best kid is. This is such a great and exciting weekend with a thousand people all vying for state championship, but only 16 people will be state champs, and that means over 900 students will be not state champs. A minute ago, when I asked you to shout out your word that describes why you joined your team, I didn't hear anyone scream, medals, plaques, trophies, right? Because probably we didn't get in it for that, but once we get sucked into the, the winning vortex, we start to think like just one more round, just one more rank, right? So um, I'd like you to keep thinking about that, that word as you compete this weekend. The most important and best coaching I've ever done was with students who didn't win, and I'd like to tell you about one. So, years and years ago, I was coaching a student named David Distelhorst, who was an extemper. And he would write all his stuff down on his index cards, and then I think hold them up in front of his, sp his face while he spoke. And he was doing terribly, you know, obviously. And I kept saying, David, just put down the index card and see what you can do without the card, but he wasn't convinced. So I tell you this story partly because we brought him down to the Cincinnati-Princeton tournament. And it was a huge tournament, seven extempers in every section. And David got the seven in every single round. He was the worst extemper at the tournament, right? So we get in the van, we're driving home to Cleveland, and he's reading his ballots. And he says, you know, as I read these, I think I'm going to try something different next time. And I say, you know, really? What do you think you'll try? And he says, I I'm thinking about going it without the index card. <laughs> Good plan, Dave. <laughs> so, so he puts the index card down, and he starts working on his actual speaking, right? Instead of just trying to read it off the card. And his sevens became fives, and then his fives became threes. And at the end of that season, he qualified for states. And you've never seen a kid do a more joyful run up the aisle and onto the stage. I think he just jumped onto the stage. He was so excited to qualify. And he went on to qualify two more times. I have no idea how he finished at the state tournament. I don't know, he made it to quarters or semis or something. But what I do remember about David is, when he invited me to his Eagle Scout Court of Honor, he spoke and he said there were two organizations that were responsible for shaping him into the person that he was. And he's up here speaking like I am now, just so eloquently. And the two organizations were the... <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm not so eloquent. Okay, so um, one was the Boy Scouts of America, and the other was the speech and debate team, and those words were a huge win for me and a huge win for David. So as you compete this weekend, please keep thinking about my nine words. Say thank you, pay it forward, and most importantly, skills, not scores, and your one word, because those are the things that will make you a winner. Thank you.